Hello everyone and welcome to lecture two. In this presentation, we'll talk about the origins and diversification of life on Earth. So let's begin with the question of what is life? Well, life is defined by the ability to replicate and undergo metabolic activity. The origins of life are quite unclear. However, there are a lot of different ideas and theories and hypotheses out there that try to explain where life began and how life began. Um, but we believe the prevailing theory is that uh, life began in three separate stages. The first was through the formation of macromolecules. So it is um, ha have hypothesized that in the early atmosphere of the planet, water, ammonia, methane, hydrogen gas, all interacted with the assistance of lightning providing energy to uh, allow for formation of complex macromolecules like nucleic acids, um, amino acids, etc. The, the second thing uh, that was predicted to have occurred is one of the main qualifications for life and it's the ability to replicate. So there is some evidence out there that um, nucleic acids, some RNA, are able to actually undergo self-replication. So it's thought that nucleic acids uh, self-replicating nucleic acids may have been the first re self-replicating unit of life. And the third um, kind of big hypothesis about how life began involves the ability to undergo metabolic activity. And this is through membrane formation. So membranes are very important for metabolism. They are the uh, the mechanism by which like the the Trans, the movement of molecules across membranes is how uh, species undergo metabolism. So the idea is that the membrane may have formed around nucleic acids in the environment spontaneously, and that is what led to the first cell. So you can imagine if you have some nucleic acids out there and all of a sudden a lipid bilayer somehow spontaneously um, forms around that nucleic acid, now we have our first rudimentary cell. And in fact, this is something similar to what has been found in the fossil record. So there's evidence of life going back as far as 3.4 billion years ago. And it, the fossil record that they found are actually cells, but they lack any organelles, they lack a nucleus or anything. It's just genetic information encased in a membrane. So this is very similar to kind of like the hypotheses of how life may have began um, and how we got the first kind of cell um, that eventually would lead to the cell as we know it today. All life on Earth are categorized into specific groups, and we'll talk about taxonomy and a little bit more about how we classify all organisms um, a little bit later in this presentation. But for now, we want to introduce the concept of species. So the species concept is defined by populations of organisms that can interbreed with one another, but cannot interbreed with organisms from other groups. This is a form of reproductive isolation, and it must result in fertile offspring. And the breeding must occur in nature. It must be a natural breeding, not something that's human driven. A species is the smallest unit of classification of life. And when we are classifying, um, when we're naming a species, we always give them a genus and species name. So uh, you'll have your genus name, which is always capitalized, and your species name, which is always lowercase. And the genus and species name are both in italics, okay? So reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation between two species can occur via two types of barriers. The first are prezygotic barriers, and these are obstacles that prevent two different species from mating in the first place, and they prevent fertilization. So this might be due to different structural, uh, structural differences in reproductive organs. It might be due to differences in courting ritual. So if those two are taking place, then these two organisms might not ever even attempt to mate in the first place. And then you also have differences in the proteins that are present on the sperm, which will uh, prevent the sperm from entering the egg because it has the wrong protein coat on that. So these are all barriers that prevent fertilization or even the attempt at mating. <laughs> 
You also have post-zygotic barriers, and these are barriers that result um, after fertilization has occurred. And this is uh, an example of this is infertile offspring. So in this picture here, we have a mule, and uh, you also have things like ligers and, and stuff like that, that they are viable offspring, but they are infertile. So they will not be able to pass on their genetic traits to any type of offspring. So they are not considered a separate species. Um, another post-zygotic barrier is death in early development. So a lot of these hybrid animals between two separate species will die very, very early in development um, due to issues with their chromosomes or issues in development, right? So as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about taxonomy. So all organisms on earth and ones that exist and ones that no longer uh, exist, so ones that are extinct, are categorized using taxonomy. There are three domains, which are the biggest categories um, of classification. There's eukarya, which contains most of the animals you're probably familiar with, um, like plants, fungi, and animals. You have prokarya, which contain most of our bacteria. And then you have archaea, which are um, an interesting group um, that kind of hovers between bacteria and eukarya, but they're actually more closely related to eukarya um, than they are to bacteria. And then in taxonomy, from domain, we then have like a, it's a hierarchy, right? So domain is the biggest. And then when you kind of separate out into a sub slightly smaller group, we have the kingdom, and then smaller than that, getting more specific phylum, more specific class, order, family, genus, until you get to the very, the most specific grouping, which is the species. So I like this image here with uh, the, these animals that goes from the domain, which is the largest classification here, which includes pretty much all living things that are eukaryotes in this image. And then it goes to kingdom. So it starts to eliminate certain um, certain organisms that don't fit within this group anymore. So it eliminated um, anything that's not an animal. And then as they as you keep going, you see that the the groupings get smaller and smaller and smaller until we get down to a very specific genus of bears and a very specific species. So you can have multiple species within a genus. Um, and, but they will not share a name. A species name, a genus species classification is very specific. There are not two organisms that have the same genus species identification. As I mentioned before, the species concept is based on reproductive isolation, and it works really well for plants and animals. Uh, when you're trying to differentiate different plant species from one another and different animal species from one another, this concept is very, very helpful. However, sometimes the lines between species aren't so clear cut, and there are several instances where the species concept is not the best uh, method of differentiating between two species. The first are for asexually reproducing organisms, also for fossils, um, because we, we won't be able to see their reproductive isolation, they're, they're fossils, they're dead. Um, organisms that evolve into other organisms. So where is the definitive line uh, drawn between when one organism later evolves into another organism? Like the line as to when you can start classifying them as different organisms is not so clear cut. Also for ring species, these are very interesting where you'll have species um, on one Side, one area that uh, are distinctly different from a species that are in another completely opposite area. And then somewhere in the middle, they may actually reproduce. But if you kind of go around the other side of that territory, they will no longer reproduce. So in this image here, they're showing that species, species over here and the species over here are two distinct species. And they have the ability to reproduce with one another in, and make a hybrid species in the center here, which are fertile hybrids, right? However, when you come onto this area 
of the territory or within within their habitat, those two species no longer can reproduce with one another. So they're a very unique uh, situation, um, as well as hybridizing species. So I just mentioned that you can have hybrids that are uh, not they're fertile. So some species are able to produce um, two species can produce a hybrid fertile offspring. So kind of where does the line get drawn for those? Speciation is the process by which we develop new species. Um, this is when one species is then breaks off into two distinct species and it occurs in two major phases. The first is through reproductive isolation. So the two new species will begin to not be able to interbreed with one another. And then as time goes on, they'll start to diverge, ev develop even more um, differences and diverge even further and further away from each other until we end up with two very distinct species, right? So that these further uh, genetic divergences might result in different phenotypes, um, like we can see with the um, Darwin's finches. These two species, like in the example that I drew here, the node in the middle, the little red circle, is showing you the original species that has then, over time, branched into two distinct species. Those two species, species A and species B, actually can no longer interbreed naturally. And that's how we know they're definitely two different species. So in this case, let's say that they're two animals um, that we can use this species concept. Speciation can result from two different mechanisms. We can have allopatric speciation or sympatric speciation. Allopatric speciation results in a results from a, um, a some sort of physical geographical separation between what that one species underwent. So yeah, in this example here, we have one single species of pine trees within this forest, and then some catastrophic event happens, an earthquake or something, and um, and it starts to develop a river, or even if it's just like a cavern or anything like that. Now that one species has officially split into two separate species over time, um, as evolution for occurs between those two um, species, those two groups of trees. You can also have sympatric speciation, which is the divergence and due to a non-geographical um, um, event, and so in this image, it's showing you that same group of tr pine trees in the forest and then through to mutation and uh, subsequent reproduction and natural selection over time you might start to be able to see the development of a, another species that grows and, and becomes more populated within the same geographic region as another species or within the same the, the parent species so how do we classify all of Earth's species? There are so many species on Earth and we actually don't even know how many there are. The number keeps growing and growing every year, um, every day as we identify new uh, species all the time. So the, the goal is to identify, not only just to identify as many species on Earth as we can, but we also want to uh, figure out how all these species are related. And the, the study of this is called systematics. And this is the classification of species with the goal of reconstructing the evolutionary history of organisms. So we don't wanna just identify all the species out there. We wanna know, okay, how is species A and B and C, D, E, F, G, how are they evolutionarily related? How far back is the last common ancestor? To do this, we commonly use a phylogenetic tree, which there's a uh, very small example over here to the right. Phylogenetic trees show you evolutionary relationships and relatedness between species. It does not tell you superiority. So sometimes they can be a little bit deceiving the way that they're um, drawn, a phylogenetic tree is drawn. If you don't quite understand how to read it, you might interpret it as, okay, the organism that's furthest left or furthest right is most advanced, the most superior species, but that is not the case. A phylogenetic tree is just telling you the evolutionary relationship and how related 
two species or three species or all the species in the world are to one another, not an indicator of superiority or how advanced something is. So in a phylogenetic tree, we have these nodes, which are these little uh, branching points here. And these branching points represent a common ancestor, okay? Or an, an, a speciation event, like we talked about in the previous, um, the previous example, that was where speciation occurred, where one species split into two distinct species. The tips of the phylogenetic tree up here, these are all represent different species. So A, B, C, D, and E in this case are each of those letters represents a different species. And we want to have phylogenetic groups. So phylogenetic group is a grouping of organisms that contains all of uh, the organisms that share a common ancestor and that common ancestor. So for example, here we have, if we want to make a phylogenetic group for um, that includes C and D, we would have to draw this blue box, right? So we have C and D, which are the two descendants, and their, their last common ancestor, which is this node here. If we wanted to make a uh, phylogenetic tree, let me sorry, if we wanted to make a grouping that included, uh, let's say we want to make a grouping that includes A, C, and D, then our grouping would have to be extended to include all the things in this green square. So we would have to include A, B, C, and D. We'd also have to include this shared common ancestor between A and B, this shared common ancestor between C and D, and then also this shared common ancestor between all A, B, C, and D and their common shared ancestors. This is what a phylogenetic grouping is. There are other grouping options, but we will not discuss them um, in, this, in this course. You will discuss it in animal biology. So um, in the past, when we did this, this grouping to, to form these phylogenetic trees and to do systematics, it was all based on physical characteristics. So uh, in the olden days, a scientist would look at two organisms and say, okay, they both have wings, they both have beaks, um, they both are blue, and they, they, they both are around medium size. Okay, these, these must be the same species. However, you can imagine that this can be a bit deceiving as two different species might have some similar characteristics. So what we've now shifted to with the development of technology and molecular biology is actually genetic analysis to differentiate species. So instead of just using physical characteristics, we now actually take genetic samples from a variety of organisms around the planet and compare their DNA and their genetic code to all the other organisms that we have uh, genetic information on in the world. And that allows us to be able to say, okay, these two organisms are actually the same species, even though they may slightly differ in color and things, they're the same species. Or these two things, they look the same, they are actually not the same species and they might be actually distantly related. Phylogenetic tree can come in various forms, so just be aware of that. Some are uh, written left to right, some are top down and oh, bottom up, and then some um, are also like this one on the side or is also bottom up, but instead of having those very square structure, it's actually kind of more of a V shape. But they're all, all these three phylogenetic trees are actually showing the exact same thing. So uh, make sure you know how to read a phylogenetic tree no matter what form it comes in. So as I mentioned um, in the last couple, in the two slides ago, we used to use physical characteristics to classify species. However, we don't use that anymore. We use genetic um, analyses, and this is why. Because sometimes physical features can be deceiving, especially in, this, in the case of convergent evolution. And convergent evolution is when you have similar features in organisms, but those two organisms are actually not closely related and that those similar features are not derived from a common ancestor. Um, so these traits that are similar, but that are derived 
not from a common ancestor, but actually derived due to natural selection are called analogous traits. And I put this image here of a dolphin and a shark because this is actually a really good example of analogous traits. So if you were to look, you know, if you were an old school scientist pre um, molecular biology and you're trying to figure out, okay, are dolphins and sharks related? You might mistakenly say that they are based on physical characteristics. They both live in water. They both have fins, right? They both have fins. I probably should have picked a lighter color. There we go. They both have dorsal fins. They both have tail fins of some sort, right? They both eat fish. And you might say, okay, they're, they're related. But in actuality, a shark and a dolphin are very distantly related. One's a fish, one is a mammal, um, but they just have analogous traits. And these analogous traits resulted via natural selection um, over time. And analogous traits are different from homologous traits. Homologous traits are derived from a common ancestor. So if you have two different species of fish, um, they may have actually developed their coloration or their, um, their limb structure from a common ancestor. Um, and if they did, then that is a homologous trait. The great thing about DNA analysis or genetic analysis is that if you use genetic analysis, you can actually differentiate between homologous and analogous traits, um, which may not be so clear if you're just looking at organisms physically. So with that said, that is the end of this presentation. Um, I recommend going ahead and reading chapter 12, sections four, five, seven, eight, nine, and 10, and then also doing the learning curve assessment. And then finally, there is a phylogenetic tree assignment that you'll find on iCollege um, that you should also uh, do and submit. Alrighty, have a good day.